And most of us, I presume, have come here this morning or go to church or anything because our life is so monotonous, so lonely, so utterly meaningless. And we want to find something that will be deeply gratifying, deeply that will bring about deep content. So, why are we discontented, and with what? Please answer the question to yourselves. I will, the speaker will go into it, but you have to answer it for yourself. The talks and the writings of Krishnamurti have, over the past four decades, given him a unique position as one of the more challenging and authentic voices of our time. The series, of which this is the concluding program, represents the first time that Krishnamurti has allowed his talks to be filmed. We are discontented through comparison. We are discontented to bring about a change in what is. And we are discontented because we don't know what to do with what is. And being discontented with what is, we develop the idea of what should be the ideal, the utopia, the gods, the heaven, and so on and on and on. So our action then is based on an idea and the approximation to that idea is action. Then I am discontented with what is and I want to be something different from what is, the idea, the idea being rational or irrational uh, thought put together as an idea or an ideal, and I have that ideal, and that according to that ideal I live, which is called action. And There is conflict between what is and what should be. And in that conflict we are caught. And all our questions demand searching is that between what is and what should be. And the greater the tension between what is and what should be, the greater the neurosis. And also greater if one has the capacity to express that conflict verbally. In the theatre, in music, in art, in so many ways, literature and so on. And being discontent with what is, 
we invent gods which becomes our religion. That is the escape we have from what is. And is it possible to radically change what is? That is the real search, not the other. The, the other is no search at all. Is it possible to totally bring about a mutation in what is. And to bring, to go into that, to go into this question of bringing about a total revolution in what is, one must have an extraordinary sense of awareness. You know, to be aware what it means. <coughs> to be aware of the trees, of the blue sky through the trees, of those hills beyond, of that noise of a motor, of the colours that are there in front. Just to be aware And to be aware so choicelessly you know very well that you can't change it. You can't change the mountains. You can't change the beauty of that sky. But when we are aware of what is, we want to transform it. We, want, we are endlessly active about it. And there begins sorrow. Because with the ending of sorrow is the beginning of wisdom. And the ending of sorrow is the understanding of what is. And the understanding of what is can only come when you observe when you are aware, when, you, when the mind is incapable of wanting to change what is, which doesn't mean it is satisfied with what is. So, one has freed the mind, or the mind has freed itself from this everlasting search that's finished. And that means a tremendous burden off of one's shoulder. Being, then being free you can look. And to look you need great energy. And that energy comes only when there is this awareness without conflict. This awareness in which there is no conflict of any kind. Just observation. And there will be conflict only as long as there is the observer and the observed, which is what is. But what is, is the observer. Please don't learn phrases, but see the actual fact. Then you will find that where there is the observer,
the center, the sensor, the experiencer, the entity that is always creating the division between the observed and the observer. And as long as there is an observer, there is no freedom. You know, every object, like this microphone, creates a space round itself and is in space. No. The object, and not only outwardly, but an object inwardly, as the me, as the experiencer, as the I, as the thinker, that center creates a space in consciousness. This space in consciousness is always limited, because there is always the centre. Right? When they expand this space from the centre, and however much you may expand, it will always, always have a border a frontier. And therefore that space is always psychologically limited, and therefore there is no freedom in that space. And that centre, that observer, is obviously memory. memory of what has been, whether of yesterday or thousand years. That centre is the tradition, is the conditioned state which has been put together by time, both chronologically and psychologically. That centre is the accumulation of knowledge, experience. It's always, that centre is always the past. Therefore that centre is not a living thing, it is a, a dead memory of what has been. And when it creates a space, whether it's very, very, very small round itself, as most of us do, concerned with itself endlessly, its activities, its, its propositions, its ideas, its, it's a shabby little thing round itself, and that can expand, but however much it may expand through various tricks of all of compulsion, of drugs, it is always within the space which the centre has created, and therefore there is no freedom, and therefore there is no peace at all. And when one observes, that only when there is space, there is freedom. And that space cannot possibly exist psychologically as long as there is an observer. Right? 
And? And one must have space, as one must have beauty. Beauty which is not man-made. And is it possible, then, if there is no time at all to end what, what is, to end the observer, and therefore to look without the interval of time? You know, time is the space between the observer and the tree. The observer is static and the tree is static, psychologically. And so to cover the distance between the observer and the tree takes time. And that distance and the, which has been created by the observer and the observed is always static, is always stationary. So when one thinks of using time or allowing time to bring about a change in the observer, you are only being caught in the static state. So when you discover that, then you ask, is it possible to change instantly what is? <coughs> the centre is violence. Hmm? I'm taking that as, a, as an example. I don't... it isn't really an example, it's a fact. One is violent, that's a fact. And the movement towards non-violence is static movement, is no movement at all. Now I explained that previously. So my our question is then, is it possible to end violence, not through time, but immediately? Because if if there is no If there is an observer, he is always l limiting the space and therefore there is no freedom. Therefore, as long as the observer exists, every form of attempt to transcend it, to go beyond it, is still a waste of time. So our question then, is it possible to end what the observer? Not what is. When there is no observer, there is no what is. It is the observer that creates what is. So, how is it possible to end the violence, aggression, or all the rest of it, the immense hatred that one has stored up, resentment. How is it possible to end it so that one is completely, totally free of it? Probably one has never asked this question. Either when I said it, one puts up with it, gets used to it, and carries on. But one, if one puts that question, either you put it casually, or you put it with intention to find out. Therefore you become very serious. And? When you put that question, because you are serious, because you are intent, then you are aware of the whole process of the 
обзова. Which means you are totally attentive. You understand? Completely attentive. And in that attention there is no border created by the center. Hmm? And when there is complete attention, there is no observer. Huh? Look, when you look at those mountains behind the speaker, they're blue, the light, straight line, and the valley, and so on. When you give your complete attention to look, Is there an observer? The observer comes into being only when, in that look, there is inattention, which is distraction. So, only total attention brings about the cessation of the observer. And when there is this ending of the observer, there is the ending of the thing which he has created as what is. Because, as we said, the observer is the observed. Now, we have in this way eliminated all conflict of search. We have eliminated all conflict between what is and what should be. We have put away the observer, and therefore there is attention from it last a second, that's good enough. Don't be greedy to have more. In that greed to have more, you've already created the center. And then you're caught. In that attention, there is no seeking at all. And therefore there is no effort. So the mind becomes extraordinarily alert, active, silent. Then only can the mind be in a state of no experience. And this is important to understand. We all depend on experience. Experience being to go through something. We all depend on experience to keep us awake, a challenge, a question. an external impetus, influence, to keep us awake. Naturally, for the moment, that, that challenge, that uh, external force keeps awake for a few minutes and one goes back to sleep. So one depends constantly on experience to keep awake. And when one realises that, you reject all outward stimulus, all outward or inward experience, then one can ask, can the mind be so intensely alert without experience? And if it is made alert through experience, it is not alert. Obviously. If a 
and experience makes me love. Hmm? Then it's not love. Behind it there is a motive. So, such a mind is the religious mind. No longer seeking, no longer demanding experiences, is not caught in visions. And such a mind has an activity totally different, at a different dimension which thought can never possibly reach. Thought has a place, very small place, but when one realizes that, thought has no place at all, which doesn't mean you live on ugly little sentiments, emotions. So one can function normally, healthily, sanely in this world with a mind that is not cluttered up by thought. And it's only such a mind, the religious mind, that can know something beyond all the imaginations and structure of man's hope. 